welcome to, to this last uh, event of our lecture series. And while we are waiting, and before I'm introducing uh, this evening's speaker, Professor Ferenc Hörcher, I would like to call your attention to the summer school, which will continue the topic of this series. And I will put in the chat uh, a link, which I hope uh, is already live. You can try and this will lead you to the website of the, the summer university course. Just tell me if it's uh, operational or not yet, because they are good. So if you or any of your students in case of uh, senior faculty would be interested in uh, applying, then applications uh, are on until the middle of February. So we would like to see as many uh, applicants as possible. And there are some uh, very favorable conditions, especially for those uh, applicants who come from uh, OSUN related institutions. This means the Open Society University Network. So Bergbeck and CU are definitely in. Other institutions are outside Europe. So probably there are no uh, participants representing the others, but you should spread the news and uh, if you are interested or you have interested students, then you are most welcome to join us. And just to uh, give a little more advertisement, it includes uh, three days in Prague besides a week in Budapest. And even those who uh, join the fee paying option will get the Prague part free of charge. So you don't have to pay for the travel and the hotel in Prague, even if uh, someone joins as a fee paying participant. So this is the advertisement part. And now just trying to see, Susanna hasn't joined us yet, but I hope she will join soon. Don't want to um, keep those who have already joined too long in suspense. So maybe I can start with the introducing this evening's speaker. And uh, unfortunately, this is the last event in the series. Uh, the good news is that from the middle of uh, January, roughly, all the previous lectures, including this one, will be available as a recording. And if you missed one or two in the series, then you can revisit uh, the lectures and uh, use it as a resource for your future work. So let's uh, turn to this evening's speaker. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome Professor Ferenc Hörcher, who will uh, give the last lecture in the series. He's a political philosopher, historian of political thought, the philosopher of art. And he's currently research professor and head of the Research Institute of Politics and Government at the University of Public Service in Budapest. And he is also a senior fellow and a former director of the Institute of Philosophy of the Research Center for the Humanities in Budapest. He studied in Budapest, also in Oxford, in Brussels and Leuven in Belgium. He was a visiting professor at the Jagiellonia University in Krakow and at the Babes Boya University in Cluj-Napoca. And his research interests include conservatism and liberalism history of early modern political thought. And he has published uh, a volume together with Thomas Lorman uh, on the history of the Hungarian constitution, law, government, and political culture in Central Europe in 2019. But even more relevant for uh, today or tonight's talk is his current research on the history of political thought in the political communities of the European city and with a particular focus in the Renaissance and uh, the early modern towns. And his publications uh, are very recent in this field. Uh, one is a chapter entitled Philosophers and the City in Early Modern Europe in the Routledge Handbook of the Philosophy of the City, which was published last year. And his recent monograph, which uh, will be also presented to you in greater detail by himself, is the political philosophy of the European city from polis through city state to megalopolis with a question mark. I couldn't read it out in the right uh, tone, I think, but 
So this is a, a question and uh, it was published with Lexing Lexington Books uh, earlier this year. And um, this book also includes a chapter on the city of the Italian Renaissance and the German city. And I presume that uh, this will be uh, the topic which uh, we will hear about today. And uh, just as a small addition to this uh, rich uh, biography, he will be faculty member of this summer university course, which uh, I've been mentioning and for which you find the link in the chat. So uh, you will, uh, those of you who joined the summer university course will uh, have the chance to meet him again. But now let's turn to this evening's talk. So uh, Ferenc, the floor is yours and we are looking very much forward to your talk this evening. Thank you, Kati, uh, and thank you for all the organizers for this uh, wonderful series of events. And it's, it's a great honor to be part of it as well as uh, a great uh, uh, responsibility to finish it. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, you will all contribute to that uh, in order to make it uh, a fine ending for such a nice uh, series. So let me try to share with you my my slides. We made an effort earlier to check if it works. Do you see it by now? Fine. Uh, maybe you can also put it in presentation mode. Yes, indeed I can. Is it in the presentation mode? No, right it's now? fine. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so let me let me start. Uh, it's uh, uh, twenty to six, uh, just to uh, just for the notes. So my topic today is the political ideology of the Renaissance and early modern city, from Bruni to Althusius. In fact, uh, in Bruni and in Althusius. So I will focus on these two authors, and uh, the reason for that that uh, they represent two typical examples. Uh, uh, of, of um, the Renaissance and the early modern version of, of, um, of the European city, how it was um, uh, conceptualized by those who act actually governed them. Uh, both of these authors did so. And you see uh, on these uh, uh, maps and, and, and uh, views of uh, uh, the city, Florence and, and Emden, the two cities that we will talk about. Uh, and the, the reason why I have this topic uh, for tonight is that, I, I, as uh, Kati mentioned, uh, I recently published uh, a volume uh, with uh, the uh, 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 not too humble title, The Political Philosophy of the European City. Uh, and uh, I would like to start out from the main assumptions of that uh, book in order to, to introduce my topic. Uh, there, these are my claims of in, in this book. I claim that there is a paradigm called the European city, and that this paradigm has a continuous, even if not a linear history from ancient Greece to the present day. It also has an ideology with certain constant features, although some of them uh, are also changing dynamically. And... Uh, this ideology can uh, be identified as urban or civic republicanism. That's, that's my major claim. And uh, I claim that this uh, ideology is present in different forms uh, from the ancient Greeks, uh, and in particular from Aristotle through the Romans, the medieval Christians to the early modern period. And uh, add to that, and this is, I think, a novel element in this series, uh, I think it has got a message for today as well. And the reason why I can uh, say is uh, say that it has a message for today is that I'm not a, a proper historian as most of the other colleagues were here, uh, uh, as I will explain in a minute. But before that, let me uh, summarize the structure of the present talk. I will present this uh, ideology, which I claim is the ideology of urban republicanism. And then I will give two examples, Bruni and Althusius. Uh, and I will add a, a third one, um, Martin Sepsic, uh, partly uh, in order to, 
to 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 share this uh, central European perspective on on the whole topic, which I, I found important in my book as well, and which I find important because of the Central European University, who is one of the organizers of this series. The methodology, uh, and that's that's the explanation part of of uh, what I said so far. Uh, I'm not a proper historian in the sense that I am. Uh, historian of political thought, and uh, I, I claim that to be a historian of political thought is hardly possible without the being a political philosopher as well. So there is uh, here two dimensions which seem to be excluding uh, each other logically, but which uh, which needs to be there in, in this job, uh, a descriptive and a normative element uh, in, in my approach. Another uh, difficulty, uh, so, so in that sense, I, I distinguish myself, my approach uh, from, uh, from some of the earlier ones who are, you know, old fashioned uh, and very professional historians. <laughs> and uh, I'm, oh, I might be old fashioned, but I'm not a professional historian. That's, uh, that's uh, for sure. I'm a historian of political thought. And as such, uh, unfortunately, I am also a political philosopher, i.e. there is a normative dimension to what I say. And the other uh, uh, caveat is that uh, uh, I will make generalizations uh, and historians are uh, not prepared to do that. Uh, I need to do so uh, because uh, I need to make general claims and general claims are required generalizations of, uh, of facts as well. And that means that when I arrive to a conclusion, uh, it will not fit any particular cities. <laughs> so that's a, that's a contradiction that uh, I have to live with, uh, but uh, I'm open to, to your views on, on that methodological dilemma. Uh, uh, some basics uh, of my, my approach. Uh, of course, I start out from the assumption which is behind the, the, the topic or the theme or the title of this series. Uh, we were talking about words and stones uh, when we talked about um, cities uh, earlier as well. And uh, this is um, my distinction, urs and uh, civitas, uh, that requires the same sort of distinction. Uh, between uh, the, the uh, infrastructure or the, the hardware and, and the, the substance uh, or, or the software of the city. Uh, the, the urbs meaning um, the, 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 uh, the place itself and the, and the architectural elements of it, natural and, and artificial. And uh, uh, civitas means the religious and political association, uh, which is uh, meant by the term uh, city. In, in, uh, I take uh, these descriptions from uh, the Coulanges' uh, famous uh, 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 well, classical uh, uh, summary of the ancient city from the second half of the 19th century. So he uses the, the French terms. That's, that's quite useful for us to see the Latin, the French, and the, the English terms uh, to make um, uh, uh, this uh, distinction. I also rely heavily on Max Weber, of course. Uh, he has got this uh, description in his uh, posthumously published uh, um, uh, uh, and not finished uh, a volume on the city where he uh, identifies uh, the, what he calls the Occidental city by the, the following marks. Uh, most of the times, not all of those uh, are present, but at least uh, uh, in, in some cases, all of them, and, and uh, in, in, in all cases, most of them. Uh, I.e. a fortification, a, a fortress, uh, which is the center or the, the core of, of, of the city, a market, uh, and then the, the, the trading element, uh, a court of its own uh, and partially autonomous law, that's the jurisdictional part of it, a form of association that's partly religious, partly uh, professional, uh, like guilds uh, or the militia, all, all those uh, sorts. And uh, also uh, uh, a requirement Weber uh, uh, pronounces is uh, 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 partial, not full uh, autonomy or, or autocephaly, which is uh, important uh, 
uh, if we consider the relationship uh, between what I call the European city and uh, the emerging uh, uh, centralized uh, uh, state and the relationship between the two. When, the, when the, uh, bringing up these, uh, these uh, classical uh, 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 precursors or, or, or uh, uh, the, the, the classical backbones of my, uh, my theory, I have to uh, make a, a tribute to Henri Piren as well and his concept of uh, democracy, early democracy or medieval democracy, which is of course uh, quite um, 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 a challenged uh, claim that there is something like that, uh, yet uh, I think it, it's fair to, 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 to mention uh, at least uh, that, uh, that he had this uh, uh, idea that, that in fact uh, um, uh, Belgian democracy should be understood in the context of, uh, of its roots, which are uh, uh, going back to the medieval uh, uh, democracies of, of the uh, 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 cities of, of uh, that uh, region. But uh, my own understanding of, uh, of the ideology of the European city is what I call urban republicanism. And I take the term from Heinz Schilling, uh, who used the term uh, for German and Dutch uh, urban developments uh, from the 15th to the early 19th centuries. And uh, of course, this is uh, based on uh, German scholarship. So one should uh, make further elaborations uh, how uh, the, the term is developed within that context. But uh, I do not have time enough and, and the knowledge enough uh, to go into details uh, for that. But I would like to explain some uh, uh, in some more details uh, Schilling's uh, Republic, what he calls the Republican vocabulary. So what we are talking about is Stadtrepublikanismus, uh, urban or civic republicanism. Uh, and uh, it has got these elements. Uh, it's based on the notion that uh, um, the, the citizens of the city have got certain liberties and certain duties in the same time. And the, the two of them are uh, in balance uh, in order to make it uh, feasible. An important part of that, uh, 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 well, uh, structure or, or constitutional arrangement is the, the active participation of citizens uh, in the affairs of, of the state or in public affairs in res publica. Uh, also importantly, uh, uh, although they, they all of them participate in the affairs, uh, there are elected bodies who take charge of the major decisions, uh, including, uh, uh, of course, the town councils. And uh, these uh, elected bodies have of office holders, major office holders who are elected on regular terms and according to uh, uh, well-regulated norms uh, uh, prescribed, or at least uh, 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 customary um, procedures. And uh, an important element in it is that there are very uh, well uh, defined uh, forms of representation, uh, mostly uh, uh, um, uh, communal uh, forms of representation, uh, uh, which means that it's not based on individual participation in, in decision making, but, but the decisions are made by bodies who represent um, uh, smaller uh, communities or, or or uh, units uh, of, of the community and, uh, and people are a part of those smaller units and this way they are represented. So it's not uh, the Rousseauian kind of uh, 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 account of, of uh, everyone participating in each of the decision, major decisions. I also uh, rely on Martin Prag, who was uh, the first uh, 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 speaker in this series. And uh, I think his, uh, his uh, uh, explanation and elaboration of Schilling's ideas are quite useful for us. So let me uh, shortly summarize uh, some of his points, which are based on, on, on the earlier slides, uh, major um, uh, uh, concepts. Uh, so uh, he claims that uh, Schilling's understanding is that uh, citizens uh, 
a desire to participate in, in the uh, exercise of political decision making. And that there are collectivities, collective forms of representation which, uh, which uh, make it possible for them to do so uh, uh, through civic organizations. Uh, and I, I use here the term civic, civil uh, interchangeably, but one should be careful uh, when they are actually, um, uh, uh, they have, whether they have got the same uh, 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 spectrum of meaning or whether they mean something different. I take it to refer to civitas, uh, so in, I use it in that uh, uh, sense. Uh, and uh, uh, these collective forms of representation uh, will build up uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the city, but it has got uh, uh, certain bodies, uh, uh, smaller and, and, and wider, um, uh, as we shall see in the Florentine case, uh, assemblies uh, which, uh, which help uh, uh, to participate in actual decision makers for as many of the citizens as possible. But basically the idea in all that is that the individual voice is less important than the collective expression of, um, uh, of views. So in that sense, this is uh, not a, a, a liberal uh, conception. Uh, we have to be aware that this is a, a pre-modern uh, world uh, and therefore, uh, even if we talk about liberty, it does not necessarily mean uh, the individual's uh, uh, personal uh, liberty. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and the basic idea is that the, 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 the importance of uh, the, 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 the communal affairs of the common good uh, has a priority over uh, the, that of the individual. He also mentions that uh, beside this term that I chose or, or Schilling chose and I took over, the urban republicanism can be replaced or, or is com competing with other ones like corporatism or communalism, which are terms used in the German context for German uh, uh, historical reasons and therefore I would uh, not uh, um, dare to use it for my general claims. Okay, and, and, and I think the final reference to a classic is uh, uh, the one that uh, is perhaps closest to my heart, if you allow me such uh, uh, exaggerations, is uh, uh, Huizinga, whose uh, uh, work is uh, uh, quite important uh, in this field as well. Uh, the, the uh, overview of uh, uh, early modern um, the Dutch uh, history, Dutch civil civilization in the 17th century, uh, which he uh, finished in 1941 during the Second World War, and that's important, uh, is, uh, is crucial for my understanding. He starts out from uh, 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 an approach uh, taken from cultural history, and he builds up uh, uh, a notion of uh, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, middle classes or uh, middle class uh, bourgeois culture, which is of course again debatable, and, and perhaps we should uh, return to it later. How the the modern concept of the bourgeoisie is connected to uh, this uh, um, uh, well old uh, 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 or or pre modern conception of of the urban uh, citizen of the burger. Right, uh, let, let me try to uh, get over this uh, uh, introductory part. Uh, this is a Weberian thing. And let's, let me turn to, to my first example, which is uh, Leonardo Bruni and uh, his account of Florence. Bruni, of course, is, a, is perhaps uh, one of the most famous uh, representatives of um, Florentine um, uh, rena Renaissance humanist uh, thought. He is a historian and a practicing uh, statesman, as we would call him. His master was uh, Coluccio Salutati, a precursor as, uh, in the position of the Chancellor of Florence, which was quite an influential, even if not too powerful position. It's 
an interesting uh, combination. Uh, Bruni himself took over this position uh, two times, uh, first uh, from uh, 1410 and then from 1427 uh, for a longer period. But he also worked uh, in a different uh, role uh, and function uh, as apostolic secretary to four popes actually uh, before uh, taking those uh, uh, civil jobs. Uh, so in a, an important sense, he is uh, uh, quite well uh, acquainted with, uh, with religious administration or, or uh, the, the administration of the church as well as the administration of, of his city. And one can uh, 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 consider whether that has any relevance for his work or not. And of course, his major work is the uh, history of Florence. We, uh, he is regarded as perhaps uh, one of the first uh, great historians of, uh, of uh, Florence. He also wrote uh, biographies of uh, the famous um, uh, uh, poets and writers of, of the, the city, translated some uh, important uh, uh, Greek authors because he had a, a well a working uh, Greek uh, uh, ancient Greek uh, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, translating Aristotle, for example, Aristotle's ethics, uh, as well as politics. And the, 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 the piece that I will talk today about is Laudatio Florentine Urbis uh, in praise of the city of Florence, um, which he published uh, as a young man, actually, at 32, 34 years old. So before his actual political career, uh, uh, took uh, uh, its uh, uh, start. And he starts out, well, this is, of course, a rhetorical exercise. One should be aware that uh, this is not yet the historian, not the politician or the political thinker. It's, it's a rhetor, a humanist rhetor, who, who is uh, doing this uh, laudatio as a, a rhetorical exercise uh, to show uh, his uh, strength of, uh, of this uh, profession and try to sell uh, himself for, for the city. He starts out from aesthetic uh, qualities. Uh, he, he claims that uh, if you come to Florence, the first thing that uh, 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 take, uh, tooks, uh, takes uh, your attention is it's a beauty, the beauty of uh, the buildings themselves and the, the natural beauty, the, the, the beauty of the natural environment. And of course, the first uh, is uh, uh, dependent on the citizens. The second is uh, uh, something given, although one can argue that uh, the choice of the, the location was uh, important. And that choice was made uh, at least according to the, uh, the traditional mythological account by the founders or the founding fathers of the city. Uh, and uh, it means that they made a good choice if, uh, if um, uh, the, the environment is so uh, uh, shockingly beautiful. And I think it's important that in this uh, account of uh, Florence, uh, this uh, aesthetic dimension is so important if we take into account uh, that, uh, that uh, the real achievements of Florence are uh, uh, at least uh, in, in its crucial parts uh, in the field of uh, art and culture. So in a way, uh, what is happening here is to use art and culture for uh, political communication. And that's, uh, I think, uh, quite an interesting and, and uh, um, forward um, uh, 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 moving uh, 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 gesture on his part. And uh, an important part of this description of, and, and I will use the term description in a, uh, in a very well-defined sense uh, later, but here uh, just generally, if we say that, uh, that uh, um, uh, what uh, uh, Bruni is doing is giving a description of the city, he is referring to the villas of the surrounding uh, uh, hills and, uh, and mountains uh, outside of the walls of the city. And these villas are important because they remind him, of course, of the Roman past of, of, uh, of uh, the city. And um, uh, there is a direct link here in the architectural history, but also 
there is a mythological dimension to this uh, lineage uh, to, to, to claim that uh, Rome is actually uh, the, 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 the starting point uh, uh, of, of Florentine history, and um, especially the, the Rome of the Republican era, not um, that of uh, the empire. And he also mentions among the, the, the public buildings, um, the holy churches and sacred places, uh, uh, which uh, means that uh, for him, uh, an important part of this uh, um, um, first uh, um, uh, site of the city is, uh, of course, the, 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 um, the, the architecture connected to the religious uh, uh, festivities and occasions. And of course, uh, that's uh, for sure. If we look at uh, at uh, at uh, uh, the city, even today from the, the surrounding uh, uh, hills, we will definitely uh, see that uh, that uh, the towers of of um, the the, um, uh, the campaniles uh, they they all have got a dimension which uh, um, uh, stresses their importance uh, as compared to the other buildings of of the city. So in this sense, architecture itself uh, has an important message uh, to make. Uh, but uh, he is not uh, uh, simply describing um, uh, buildings or, or architectural structures. What he's interested more is, of course, the citizens. Uh, Florence is not uh, um, a collection of uh, an assembly of, of uh, architectural sites and, and important uh, uh, productions of, uh, of human art, but also uh, collections or, or uh, assemblies of human beings. And these uh, 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 have got their history. And that's uh, very important that uh, in this ideology of uh, Florence that he builds up, uh, an important element is uh, the reference to the past, to, to, the, uh, to the forerunners, to the uh, heritage that, uh, that uh, they uh, uh, take over from, uh, from the earlier generations. And uh, of course, this is uh, the reason why they can uh, still enjoy freedom. Uh, it's, uh, it is the basic um, heritage that they took over from their um, uh, ancestors uh, to, to keep uh, their city free of uh, enemies uh, and uh, tyrants, internal tyrants as well, by the way. And that's an important part of the story after Bruni's time, because he is still the representative of uh, the Republican era within uh, Florentine history. And an important part, how to save uh, the city, how to keep uh, its liberty is, uh, uh, of course, what he calls the crown of walls. And uh, we look and have a look at, at uh, this uh, crown in this uh, um, uh, depiction of the city, and we see how important it is uh, for the uh, painter that that um, he, he emphasizes uh, the contours uh, of of the towers and and the walls because they make uh, the city safe. Uh, and it's important that uh, um, what 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 Bruni claims uh, about the walls is that uh, they are. Uh, not uh, too frightening, but frightening enough. Uh, that's that's uh, what you need uh, to to get uh, a balance of of uh, of not exaggerating it, but still trying to 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 defend the city whenever it's necessary. Uh, but not uh, to to exaggerate it because that would uh, mean. Uh, that would be a display of a lack of confidence, and uh, confidence is crucial in, uh, in this uh, rhetorical exercise, of course. And we arrive to the concept of democracy. Uh, I mentioned Henri Piren, who, who claimed that uh, democracy is uh, crucial in, in this uh, European uh, experience. Uh, and in fact, that's the term that is used uh, by, by uh, uh, Bruni. Of course, uh, one should be careful what he means by the term, but the term is there. Uh, and interestingly, it is combined with the, the principle of law as well. So it's a principle and a, a lawful uh, democracy that he is advocating. 
Uh, and uh, the claim is that this is directly taken over from uh, the Roman concept of liberty. So in this sense, this is a neo-Roman uh, concept. And here I am, of course, referring to Quentin Skinner's famous uh, uh, approach to this early part of the Renaissance uh, when, uh, when, um, when the neo-Roman uh, ideas uh, re-emerge uh, uh, in the medieval context. Uh, and again, uh, one should emphasize that this liberty is that of the city, uh, and, uh, and uh, it serves the well-being of all. It does not serve individuals uh, for their own sake. It serves the well-being of all. Uh, and that means, uh, once again, that, uh, that this is not a liberal vision of uh, liberty, but uh, uh, liberty before liberalism, once again taken from a term from uh, Skinner. Uh, but equal, equality is uh, just as important uh, for him, uh, uh, equality before the law. Uh, and I think these are crucial notions that we still use today perhaps in a different sense, but uh, one should uh, be aware of, of uh, uh, the importance that uh, is attributed here to this uh, notion. Um, the, uh, the, the urban community is a community of equals in the sense uh, that they all are equal to the, before the law, they, they, uh, the same law needs to be applied uh, to all of them, uh, irrespective of their social status or or a position that they take in the hierarchy of the city. Because of course it's a hierarchical society, but as far as their legal status is concerned, all of them, as soon as they are citizens, are taken as, as equals before the law. One can compare this uh, description of Florence as a democracy and uh, as a uh, as, uh, 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 city governed by law and uh, uh, by the concept of equality before the law with la some later writings. Uh, I take here two uh, later writings, one from the middle period of his life and one from the um, uh, later part of, the, of it. And we see that uh, he is not uh, really uh, uh, constant with, with, uh, with uh, his uh, description of, of the constitutional regime of, of his city, because in this oration for the funeral of Nanni, Nanni Strozzi, he uh, refers uh, to the liberty and equality of, uh, all the cit of all the citizens, and calls therefore uh, this uh, constitution a uh, popular constitution. Uh, I wonder if uh, 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 by, uh, the present day the translator would uh, translate it a populist uh, constitution. Uh, that might have been uh, uh, an even more interesting uh, topic. But, uh, but basically, the, the issue is that uh, here, uh, uh, liberty and equality uh, is uh, inclusive. Everyone is taken uh, as part of, of that uh, uh, a constitutional arrangement uh, uh, with equal uh, 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 value or, or, or worth. But that's not the case in the, uh, in the late paper where uh, he claims that the Florentine constitution is not completely aristocratic and not completely democratic either. It's a kind of mixture of the two anti-aristocratic in certain sense, because uh, of course uh, there are these uh, laws that uh, certain positions cannot be taken by aristocrats, in fact. But it's also anti-democratic in, um, in a certain way, because of course the, the poor have got uh, less uh, ability to participate in the assemblies. And uh, uh, my uh, hunch on that is that uh, this is uh, an Aristotelian uh, account. Of course, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, the, the scheme is taken over from Aristotle, and um, there are discussions of which of them uh, are really uh, favored by, by Aristotle himself. But I think that this um, uh, uh, um, description of Florence as uh, an aristocratic and democratic uh, uh, mixture is uh, close to 
the Aristotelian account of uh, the Politeia. So that's that's uh, that's. Uh, uh, but it's it. One can also uh, uh, consider whether his political experiences are not uh, important, perhaps for for that uh, final formulation of of uh, his description of the constitutional regime. I.e., that uh, he is perhaps uh, by that time uh, 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 disillusioned by the, the by the, the political. Uh, 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 activity of of uh, what he called the popular uh, uh, element uh, in the, in the uh, uh, society of of his uh, state, uh, and he becoming uh, one of the key figures uh, in the in the uh, political elite. He might uh, think that uh, that his uh, uh, space of maneuver, his uh, his uh, uh, space uh, elbow room, is is. Uh, is limited by 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 too much uh, democracy uh, uh, taking uh, uh, away uh, his uh, his uh, uh, decision making uh, powers. But that's of course just uh, just uh, the the political philosopher uh, 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 thinking about the backgrounds of of his claims. Uh, one should be careful with that. Uh, so do not take it too seriously. Uh, what is in, more important, perhaps, is that uh, in the early piece, so we are now back to, to the Laudatio, he is uh, 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 emphasizing the technique, the, the constitutional regime uh, uh, against the misuse of power, which is a very important uh, uh, notion, I think. Uh, he wants uh, 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 to, to, to present uh, uh, the, the legal order of the city as uh, uh, able to prevent uh, anyone in particular to gain more power than uh, what is uh, allowed uh, by the law, including the highest officers as well. And that's of course interesting in the time when the Metiches will come and uh, take over um, the, the, the government of, of, of the city. Well, I talked about the ancestors. I, I, I will not uh, deal with that too much more. I, I think it's important uh, that, uh, that he keeps emphasizing this dimension of, uh, of uh, the relation of, of the present generation and, and, uh, and the founders and the ancestors uh, who um, uh, determined uh, uh, the direction of, of, of um, the city's uh, uh, future. What is uh, perhaps more interesting is the virtues, how he describes the virtues of Lawrence, what sort of virtues are important for him. Of course, uh, these are taken from the, the, the available possibilities, uh, both in the uh, theological discussions and in the uh, discussions uh, in the uh, 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 ancient uh, about uh, uh, political and moral virtues. Uh, and uh, the, the major issue is, of course, uh, justice. Uh, um, uh, 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 well working uh, regime should uh, provide justice uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the city for, for all. But uh, uh, there are further uh, uh, cardinal virtues that, that are uh, emphasized by him, and uh, the two major ones are prudence and moderation. Uh, uh, I, uh, of course, I am uh, a bit uh, overemphasizing now the prudence, uh, but uh, with good reason. I think that, in fact, uh, we forgot about uh, the importance of prudence uh, in uh, uh, practical politics uh, 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 in this era. Uh, this is because we read Machiavelli, and of course, uh, Machiavelli has a special um, uh, uh, interpretation of prudence, uh, where it uh, is connected uh, with uh, with the power and, uh, and the control of fortune. But the prudence in the uh, original Republican uh, 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 context is is a virtue um, per se. It it means. Uh, um, the, the practical wisdom uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, in in the sense that uh, Aristotle used the term uh, phronesis, uh, and that's uh, I think uh, that's a direct link uh, connecting uh, Aristotle through the Roman Republican discourse uh, and and uh, and then taken over by by people like uh, Bruni. And the, the, and the third cardinal virtue is moderation that, that uh, he keeps emphasizing. And moderation is connected uh, in his uh, understanding with balance and measure. Uh, uh, these are terms that uh, have got uh, uh, moral as well as uh, aesthetic uh, overtones. So uh, it's important to see that uh, 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 he is taking over the Ciceronian discussion of uh, decorum, in fact, uh, to find a balanced way of uh, behavior, uh, of, of uh, uh, st structural balance, and also uh, balance uh, in, in uh, the sense uh, of uh, architecture and, uh, and the fine arts. Uh, these are all connected in the minds of, of these people, I argue. And uh, even the weather can be moderate uh, in the sense uh, that uh, neither too hot nor, nor too cold, uh, balanced and, uh, and uh, moderate. But uh, there is a fourth uh, cardinal virtue which uh, appears as well, and that is courage, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he takes that again uh, from, from the Roman uh, Republican tradition and the love for glory, and the great deeds and, and the dignitas, all of them are connected to the martial virtues that the, the Republican Romans uh, were famous for. And he takes uh, Florence as uh, the key example. And in fact, uh, in the sense that, uh, that uh, indeed uh, Florence uh, was one of the most aggressive uh, um, city-states of uh, the uh, early Renaissance period in Italy is, uh, he, he is right. So it, it's a good description, but it's also a normative thing. He wants these citizens to be um, uh, virtuous uh, in that sense as well. He talks about the three boards uh, governing the city, the nine men who are uh, elected in a special and well-defined way uh, for this position, the board of 12 good men, and the uh, standard bearers of the youth, uh, uh, 16 of them, all of them uh, uh, making up uh, the, the council of uh, the 18. Uh, so it's a very well structured and well uh, uh, prepared uh, uh, regime of, of, of uh, councils uh, uh, taking responsibility for certain uh, decisions and, and leaving others to, for general assemblies. There is a, uh, an assembly of uh, a, a greater and a smaller assembly of 300 and 200 peoples. So indeed, there is this popular element uh, in it. In that sense, it's a, a kind of a mixed regime uh, indeed. And the final note is uh, uh, again uh, an aesthetic note, political harmony or uh, 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 musical harmony. Uh, he uses this uh, musical metaphor uh, very uh, skillfully to try to um, argue for uh, harmony in the social sphere and in the political realm as well, which uh, is uh, the notion of concord, concordia, that is uh, crucial in this respect. Uh, the basic uh, uh, failure of a uh, um, uh, 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 political uh, community is fraction, uh, uh, division uh, within its uh, body. And, uh, and uh, the major virtue is Concordia, uh, kind of harmony uh, where each and every uh, smaller unit finds its way uh, uh, to participate and, and not to uh, uh, exclude any other parts, but balancing each other as well. This pleases the minds and eyes of men with its harmony. Conclusion, uh, conclusion of Bruni's laudation, he is, that's my claim, using uh, uh, aesthetic and moral terms to describe uh, the ideal uh, uh, society which he identifies with the society of uh, Florence of his time. 
uh, uh, what else could a nation desire? That's, that's the poetic question or rhetorical question that he ends up with. Let's turn now to uh, uh, the German Empire uh, and uh, uh, somewhat later, uh, uh, um, late 16th, early 17th century uh, Germany, uh, Northern Germany. Uh, and the example is uh, Johann Althusius, a uh, German lawyer or jurist uh, and um, a Calvinist religious uh, uh, authority and a, a political uh, uh, leader as well as a political thinker. He is a, a, a well-educated person studying in Marburg, Cologne and Basel, um, very uh, famous centers of learning. Uh, uh, in uh, the empire and becomes a professor of law at the newly founded uh, Protestant Calvinist Herborn Academy. It's very important to see that between the two of my heroes, um, the, the reformation takes place and it turns um, the whole thing uh, into something uh, different. It, it, it gives a dramatic uh, turn in, in certain senses. Um, and, and that's, uh, I think, uh, when, uh, when uh, the German uh, example becomes uh, crucial, because, of course, uh, Germany is uh, the major battlefield for these uh, Protestant um, uh, 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 denominations for both the Lutheran and the Calvinist uh, 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 effort uh, to, to rejuvenate uh, 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 religious uh, life and, uh, and belief. Uh, Christian belief in, in, in Europe. And uh, as a, an, uh, a professor of, of this Protestant Calvinist uh, Academy, he wrote uh, his uh, uh, piece, uh, Politica, politics methodically set forth and illustrated with sacred and profane, profane examples in six, uh, 1603. And interestingly, uh, this is a, a a uh, very uh, uh, exceptional uh, case that he becomes, uh, uh, he is invited uh, to, to uh, try what he did uh, in actual practice. And that's uh, why he, uh, get, he moves uh, uh, from the academy to, to Emden, where he becomes a city syndic and will become a, a religious leader of the uh, city as well. And in this uh, uh, system that he builds up in the Politica, he has got a very well-defined uh, chapter on the life of the city. He first of all distinguishes between the private and the public association. He claims that the public association is an, in fact a collection of private associations um, uh, building up an inclusive political order, a symbiotic uh, um, uh, um, body of um, uh, associations, and uh, it ha it requires fixed laws to to work properly, uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, quite uh, um, comparable to to what we saw in in uh, Bruni's case. Uh, and importantly, these uh, 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 private associations uh, like families and collegia. Uh, 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 consists of citizens, and he very definitely distinguishes citizens from foreigners or outsiders, uh, uh, people who are excluded from, uh, from the city in, in this sense, i.e. in the sense of uh, taking part and taking responsibility for its uh, uh, government. Uh, because it is the duty of the citizens to, to uh, uh, take part in the, the public association of, of, uh, of the city, uh, and they have to adapt themselves to the customs of the place. Uh, I mean, the foreigners also have to adapt themselves, but they will not become uh, automatically citizens by that. He makes a distinction between the town and the city uh, because of the different size or scale of them. That's less important for us than the other one, the distinction between urbs and civitas. He claims that uh, uh, a community of citizens is called a city in the sense of civitas, and uh, the same urban area is called the urbs. Uh, so he makes the distinction that I referred to in, in the introductory part. 
and uh, the citizens uh, will build up uh, the civitas as a community uh, of uh, citizens. It requires a chief administrator, but that's uh, perhaps less important, although one should not underestimate the, the importance that, or the, 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 the actual authority that he uh, uh, earns. Uh, uh, I mean, Althusius himself in Emden, he becomes quite, quite um, 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 an authoritative voice uh, in the, in the uh, life, uh, political life of the city. So in this sense, he is uh, indeed uh, uh, becoming more and more like, uh, like uh, uh, um, 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 a chief administrator and not uh, one uh, of uh, uh, um, general council or, or uh, an assembly. He uh, emphasizes uh, uh, the, the, the body called the Senate, which is a collegium of wise and honest select men. Uh, uh, who legitimately convoked represent the entire peoples. So here again, we have got the idea of representation already. Uh, not everyone will take part in everything. They are represented uh, by the legitimate bodies if legitimately convoked. Uh, and the, it is uh, the job of these senates uh, to make uh, deliver judgments uh, 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 in, in the proper um, uh, procedures uh, that uh, is required. He also adds that uh, the prince or the count who is uh, uh, responsible in certain cities might have a say in electing those uh, members of uh, the collegium uh, called senate. And in this sense, it's a different story than, uh, than Brunitz one. This is not independent uh, in the sense that, uh, that um, uh, a, a full autonomy or, or, or uh, 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 sovereignty could be acquired by the city. We are within the realm of the, of the Holy Roman Empire. And in this sense, um, uh, they uh, most uh, all of the time actually they have got uh, uh, um, um, someone above above the city who will actually uh, uh, take charge or or, or uh, safeguard their liberty uh, beside their own one. Uh, again, the, the majoritarian principle is uh, 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 claimed i.e. that decisions are made uh, according to the vote of uh, the majority and everyone need to take that uh, judgment, uh, that vote uh, as uh, theirs. So, so the majoritarian principle is very important uh, in this uh, process. And uh, uh, the order that he wants to see is a political and legal order based on what he called mutual concord, a communication among citizens, uh, which uh, results in a concord. So once again, we have got this notion of harmony, of, of doing things together in agreement with each other, which is very important uh, for him, uh, and uh, which uh, he enforces very uh, powerfully. He was invited to the city because uh, of the internal and external uh, uh, dangers or, or uh, challenges against uh, its liberty. And what it does is uh, making order in the very uh, uh, ordinary sense of the word, i.e. Uh, uh, letting everyone uh, uh, out uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 sight who do not have a legal uh, uh, claim uh, to take part in the uh, government of the city. He was a lawyer, uh, but he was also a very powerful practical um, magistrate and, and he could uh, organize the city so as to defend itself. And uh, uh, he gave the, the ideological uh, background, background for that uh, uh, fight. And uh, uh, an important part of it is the city, city constitution. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, went back in times immemorial, but which uh, had a, 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 a legitimacy which is uh, 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 which cannot be defended, uh, which cannot be uh, uh, challenged uh, uh, lawfully. 
and uh, the political and the ecclesiastical are uh, uh, taken uh, together by him. And in that sense, his uh, understanding of the city is quite close, I would argue, to Calvin's understanding of it uh, in, in Geneva, i.e. that the political function cannot work without the ecclesiastical function and the vice versa. And therefore you need uh, um, uh, someone or, or um, bodies that uh, can control both of these fields. So there is uh, this uh, idea that, uh, that um, the city is uh, 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 community of believers and uh, the community of believers uh, are arranging their uh, business in a political way as well. So the two uh, cannot be separated. Uh, this is a different notion uh, than the, the medieval notion of the two uh, swords uh, uh, going back to, uh, to the debates about papal authority uh, in the medieval uh, debates. Uh, so in that sense, uh, and that's why I, I said that the, 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 the reformation is crucial because this is the point that, um, that they take uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, basically Calvin's uh, teaching uh, of, of the role of uh, the church in, 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 in secular life, which is a different notion than, than uh, the earlier one. Yet the citizens have their own responsibilities. Uh, they, they have to guard uh, the city and, and pay the, the expenses and sustain uh, their um, uh, magistrates. They also have certain rights uh, that they can enjoy. And uh, again, we have got uh, an e equality before the law. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, very important for him. And uh, also uh, citizenship is, is crucial. And uh, I, I would like to refer here again to uh, Martin Prague, who uh, mentioned earlier that uh, citizenship was crucial uh, in, in uh, city life uh, of this uh, period. And one should uh, uh, consider whether that, uh, that might uh, be something uh, uh, worth uh, to reconsider in in uh, in present day context as well, but I will return to the at the end. I do do I have still some five minutes or so? Do you think, Kati? Yes, yes, definitely five minutes uh, for sure. But then maybe we should save some time for discussion as well. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. indeed. So I finish with with the notion of concord and discord in in uh, in uh, Althusius too. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, these terms are crucial if we want to understand um, uh, city life in, in the early modern context. It's present in Bruni and, and uh, the pre-Reformation context and in Arthusius' uh, Reformation context. But now uh, I would like to use this final few minutes to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, Martin Sepsic on board who was uh, 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 an early 17th century uh, traveler uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, Upper Hungary uh, to, to uh, a tour around uh, Western Europe. And uh, why I do so is because he bring, uh, he, he wrote uh, all his experiences after he has arrived back to, uh, to, to Kasha where he became the schoolmaster. And, and these uh, 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 notes were uh, put down in, in the native language and uh, they have got uh, very important uh, references to, to city life uh, around uh, Europe, uh, uh, including London and Paris, but also smaller places in, in basically in Germany, but also in, uh, in uh, some other countries, including uh, the Netherlands. And the genre uh, might uh, be looked at, but I don't have time for that. Instead, I would like to call attention to Sepsi's uh, uh, aesthetic description, because I mentioned that description is an important notion uh, uh, when talking about uh, um, uh, the early modern experience of city life. Uh, and here, uh, the connection between Urs and Civitas becomes crucial. Why? Because whenever Sepsi arrives to a city, 
he gives an overall view of the city, an overview, so to say, including the geographical locations. And from that, uh, uh, he uh, gets to the, uh, to the uh, civitas element, to the, uh, the citizens, the inhabitants, and um, the public life, uh, including uh, the trades uh, and, and, uh, and uh, professions and uh, the uh, legal and religious orders, uh, uh, as well as uh, the customs uh, of the day. And here I wanted to show this uh, interesting um, uh, connection, which I claim uh, there is between what uh, Svetlana Alpers uh, 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 referred to in connection with the 17th century Dutch art, i.e. that these people were uh, very much interested in giving um, descriptions of the world around them, either uh, a global or celestial uh, 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 dimensions. And uh, what, they, uh, what Svetlana Alpers claims is that this is a, a wholly new way of looking at the world. It is connected to the new science uh, of the day, but it's also connected to the new understanding of uh, social life. And I think that uh, what, uh, what Sepsi Chombor does is indeed connecting these uh, different dimension, the aesthetic, the, 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 the scientific as well, because he has got statistics. Uh, he has got a lot of numbers uh, about uh, uh, the institutional arrangements and the infrastructure of, of the cities. Uh, but also uh, political con uh, conclusions are also drawn by him. And uh, in, in, in fact, uh, he, one of his key examples uh, are the Netherlands, uh, uh, because uh, what he claims is that these well-ordered cities uh, are, are uh, both aesthetically uh, inviting and, and, uh, and uh, uh, glorious, but also uh, uh, they are very efficient uh, as far as their economy is concerned and uh, well ordered uh, socially as well. So in this sense, uh, uh, he tries to give a description of all that, including uh, the infrastructure, the, the, the uh, architectural uh, uh, styles uh, and, and, uh, and uh, innovations that they use, including the dams and uh, all those uh, 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 tricky ways of, of controlling nature, but also uh, the, the, the self-regulating manners uh, in which uh, the, the Dutch cities uh, can control uh, their lives and the lives of their um, citizens. And uh, what he does in this uh, travelogue is uh, uh, reading the cities, i.e. Uh, to make sense of the, uh, of the hardware of the city and try to read them as signs, as symbols of, uh, of the civitas element, of the, of the uh, uh, life uh, and, uh, and habits uh, and ways of thinking of, of the uh, 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 people living there. And uh, for example, he has got a description of Emden as well, uh, of uh, Arthusius's city. And, uh, and interestingly, what he remarks is uh, more the, 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 the thriving uh, uh, trade and, and, uh, and uh, the, the port and, and the market and less, uh, less uh, the, the religious dimension, although he refers to the large church as well, and that might represent uh, uh, the, the, the religious, uh, uh, the importance of the religious dimension. And what he provides is in fact, uh, this, uh, this very interesting methodology of uh, 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 writing about cities, giving empirical descriptions of physical space and trying to interpret those physical uh, uh, spaces as far as their uh, meaning is concerned in the, the social and political and religious fields. So that's, uh, that's I think, a very, uh, uh, very uh, 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 useful way to, to, to make sense of, uh, of cities uh, if you are a traveler spending only a few days or 
maximum a uh, few weeks or uh, in, in, the, in the case of Danzig, he spent there one and a half year because he studied at the gymnasium there. But, but basically very short time, you have to make sense of the city and you, you have to connect what you see with, uh, with what uh, you can uh, attribute to, to, to those signs. And he is doing it very well. How? By com comparing uh, them with each other and with his own hometown. And that is, I uh, claim, the, the Central European perspective. He refers to uh, Kasha, Kosice, which is, um, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the scale that he uses. For example, when describing uh, the, the, the building Louvre, he claims this court is all of dressed stone and it occup occupies as much space as half of the whole town of Kasha. So the, the single uh, 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 royal court uh, is almost as big as half of the whole town of Kasha. It is being enlarged by 30 fathoms in length. So uh, we see that the, the dimensions are uh, uh, weight uh, uh, and 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 uh, this is a comparative method uh, where importance and and uh, and uh, weight uh, is uh, measured by 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 distance and by by physical space and uh, the same uh, 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 purpose is uh, also served by his uh, reference to uh, the Latin inscriptions on 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 certain. Uh, uh, buildings, uh, which uh, again bring up uh, the, the same uh, concept that we were discussing earlier. So I would conclude uh, uh, this talk uh, with the following claims. I think that the European uh, city uh, represents a political practice as well as an implied political thought, which uh, needs to be further uh, studied uh, because of its uh, importance, uh, philosophical importance, I would claim, and which was neglected uh, since uh, um, the birth of the centralized state uh, uh, and uh, the, the political theory, which is uh, uh, giving an account of that uh, centralized state, for example, in Baudin and Hobbes. And uh, this is uh, because I think that uh, uh, the early modern, uh, the Renaissance and early modern city uh, represents um, an unparalleled success in certain senses uh, in cooperation between groups of citizens. The earlier martial spirit is uh, turned into commerce, industry, and intellectual labor, and it brings autonomy to these um, uh, 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 communities or semi-autonomy, and sometimes semi-autonomy is much better or, or safer than, than real autonomy. And that might be interesting in our context when the European Union uh, 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 takes over some of the roles of the Holy Roman Empire in, in, in the early modern context. And uh, they had the very well-defined bodies of administration with their procedures, uh, and they achieved ordinary citizens' participation as well. They gave very well-defined rights and uh, duties to those citizens, although excluding others who were not uh, uh, given the, the title of citizenship. And also they produced a very exceptional built environment, a common product of generations of uh, uh, citizens cooperating on them. And uh, in this sense, uh, the early modern city is a success in commercial, military, financial, administrative, and spiritual functions. Perhaps the military is the most debatable of all that, but otherwise I think uh, it stands the claim. And, uh, and my proposal, and this is the political philosopher talking, uh, uh, taking over uh, uh, the, the conclusion uh, from, uh, from the historian of political thought. The proposal is that urban citizenship needs to be reassessed as an independent level of making and reflecting on politics. Thank you for your interest and looking forward to questions and comments. Well, thank you very much, Ferenc, uh, for this overarching uh, concluding lecture of our series. I think you've managed not only to highlight three very important uh, political thinkers and their works, but also to summarize many of the notions which have been 
uh, mentioned by various lecturers in the series. And I do hope that uh, those who could stay with us, unfortunately, we got some messages that uh, there were other uh, events where some of our audience had to leave, but still we have uh, a select and uh, well um, versed group of audience here. And I'm looking forward to uh, questions, comments, uh, suggestions to all these um, proposals and uh, all the new ideas which were summarized in uh, Professor Hörcher's talk. So the floor is open. Uh, students have uh, usually the first right to, to ask questions, but of course, everyone is included. So, so Daria, please. Um, yeah, thank you for your lecture. Uh, hopefully you can hear me well. Yes. Um, yeah, so my question uh, considers mostly uh, Bruni and Althusius. I will start with uh, Bruni. Um, I know that, for instance, in Machiavelli, uh, in his uh, discourses on Levy, mostly, um, he highlights the role of quarrels and social unrest for, um, I mean, as growing uh, force uh, for the Republic, uh, for Republicans, uh, you know, for Republican virtues. And um, um, he opposes this idea of consensus as a main Republican um, idea. Uh, so I wonder what about quarrels and social unrest uh, um, we can find in Bruni's writings? Uh, is it just Machiavellian later thing about quarrels or um, Bruni is just, uh, I don't know, mostly concentrating on uh, this consensus? Well, thank you for the question. It's it's really important to 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 try to assess uh, the relationship between the two of them, Bruni and the Machiavelli. But uh, I think that uh, we should start out uh, uh, first of all to 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 state that Machiavelli was an original thinker. So, in a sense, uh, and and perhaps a stronger philosopher than Bruni himself, because uh, Bruni's main uh, Achievement is not to, to think about something new. <laughs> what he did was to, to, to reintroduce re, uh, uh, older ideas and try to summarize some of the traditions of his city. While Machiavelli was trying to do something new he, and also something original, uh, something that belongs to his own uh, conception of, of uh, politics. And in this sense, what he does is, uh, is uh, um, uh, subverting uh, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, well, uh, destroying the, 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 the consensus about uh, political uh, life in the city, I would say. Why? Because he claims that, in fact, uh, the, the powerful uh, uh, prince is uh, indeed uh, able to take control over the city uh, and he actually should do so. So in that sense, uh, his conception of politics is about willpower. And that's uh, something uh, quite uh, uh, contrary to the major assumptions uh, of, um, of city life in, in, in Europe. It's not contrary to some of the ancient ideas uh, of, of uh, politics. So Machiavelli takes over uh, some ideas uh, from the great uh, uh, emperors uh, of, of Rome, for example. But, uh, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that he is doing it in the context of the city of, of, of Florence. Uh, but I think that he has in mind already uh, the, the, the emerging uh, 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 territorial state, in fact. Uh, he wants to unite uh, Italy and therefore um, uh, he, he, he requires this, this powerful um, uh, 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 leader um, and and that's uh, that's uh, really uh, 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 impossible to 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 peacefully negotiate with with the, the earlier concept of the city as a as a harmonious uh, cooperation of of uh, smaller units. So that's a di different idea, 
and and one can of course uh, uh, give good arguments that uh, that uh, Machiavelli is right in 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 certain respects. I that to survive uh, you need to be um, uh, aggressive. You know the, this evolutionary approach to 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 politics, uh, and in this sense. Uh, uh, one should not say that well one or the other was right. I think that, that they highlight different dimensions of uh, political life, and also they highlight uh, uh, the different uh, nature of politics on different levels or scales of uh, political organization. So maybe city life needs to be ordered differently uh, than than uh, the life of the territorial state or an empire. I wonder if that uh, that's, uh, sounds uh, reasonable. Yeah, thank you. It uh, absolutely makes sense. And if I may, uh, I would uh, um, continue with my questions uh, because it's all related um, to what you were saying. You also mentioned that um, Bruni is uh, um, connected in some way to Aristotle. But as far as I know, Aristotle is um, kind of opposed to the idea of democracy. And uh, um, I wonder how it's connected with Bruni. Uh, as as far as I understand, Bruni is uh, um, like standing for a uh, republic and uh, um, citizens' participation, more or less, in urban government. So I wonder um, how it's connected to Aristotle. And also, uh, my final question, because I'm taking too much time from other participants. Um, what about uh, the comparison uh, to well, Venice? Because I, I can explain it. Uh, so for instance, in Machiavelli again, and I believe uh, in Venetian writer, uh, Gasparo Cantarini, uh, there, are this, uh, there is a, a, a sort of intellectual fight uh, whose idea of Republic is better. And uh, uh, Venice is uh, usually referred as um, kind of, uh, you know, Spartacan um, model of Republic uh, where it is very peaceful, oligarchical, and uh, um, uh, there is like not no public militia or anything. Like citizens are very um, uh, strictly defined group and uh, uh, the Republic is there only for the, well, noblemen and uh, some of the citizens, but not for the populace. And it's in, in historical, in historiography, this idea is usually opposed to what of the Florence, because Florentine Republic is, uh, you know, mostly um, engaged uh, uh, with the citizens' participation and citizens' unrest, and um, it's so different. So, um, did Bruni mention this uh, opposition? Uh, that did he try to uh, define the Florentine Republic uh, and virtues? Uh, as opposed to Venetian ones? Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, two good questions. Uh, as for Aristotle, indeed, uh, of course, uh, uh, ideally, he would, uh, he would f uh, go for the rule of uh, one uh, kingdom. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's for sure. But uh, of course, we don't live in an ideal world, and Aristotle was well aware of that. And uh, of course, his acquaintance with the uh, one ruler, uh, uh, Alexander, is uh, of course enough for him to 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 be cautious about that. And in that sense, uh, in real world situations, uh, uh, he knows that, that this perfect and virtuous ruler is. Uh, is uh, something to to require too much from human nature, and in that respect, uh, he is not uh, so sure about that. In in fact, he arrives to a combination of uh, certain elements, and uh, what he combines is is more the aristocratic and uh, the democratic element, as he sees in the in the actual life of Athens. But uh, but you are right that he has got. Uh, quite in, uh, important uh, 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 cautionary remarks about democracy. And I think that uh, in, in the light uh, of uh, uh, the modern experiences, uh, he has got uh, some uh, very uh, thoughtful uh, uh, cautionary remarks in that respect. Uh, and I'm again uh, referring to, uh, to populism uh, uh, as a term. But uh, uh, 
so that's that's for for Aristotle. If 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 you do not mind, uh, it, it, we could go on with it and and discuss uh, uh, the possibilities of uh, understanding his uh, his account of of these uh, three um, uh, levels and their distorted forms. But uh, uh, I would uh, address your second, uh, the second part of your question, i.e., the comparison of between uh, Venice and and Florence, and of course, these are. Uh, 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 you know, constructions of uh, of identity. So one should be careful uh, uh, not to take too seriously the, those constructions. But and and also there is a difference uh, between the the, the time frame uh, because the, the the city states are developing from uh, this uh, autonomous or, or semi autonomous status into the signoria and 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 uh, the rule of of, of one. So uh, Contarini is is uh, uh, later than 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 Bruni, and in this respect, uh, uh, a different part of of this development. Uh, but uh, but 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 yes, basically there is a difference between the Venetian understanding of of. Uh, of uh, Concord and and the Florentine wine. The Florentine wine is is definitely a competitive uh, uh, one, and 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 the Venetian one is more like an, an organic one, I would claim. Uh, and and one should be careful not to to again not to to uh, be too fast uh, in in judgment. Because uh, of course it, it might seem that well uh, an organic one might be much better than the competitive one because the competitive one easily turns into a fighting a, a, a civil war like uh, situation. On the other hand, without competition, there is no real development uh, as, as as we know in in modernity's uh, 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 perspective. So uh, in fact, uh, the competition is is a crucial dimension of of uh, our own. Um, uh, uh, perception of of, uh, of political life. So uh, and and of course Venice with its uh, its uh, uh, harmonious or uh, 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 well ordered uh, uh, structure uh, became quite uh, stagnating after some time and 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 could not uh, develop uh, its structure because it was so uh, so uh, sclerotic uh, in in certain ways. So. Uh, on the, well, uh, of course, you can say that well. At least it was uh, a, a well-defined order, and and not uh, you know five years uh, uh, of this experience, and then uh, a brutal and and bloody uh, change for another one. But something that is on kept on track, and and people knew what to expect uh, from uh, from political life. So so one can argue both ways, but uh, but I but I see your point that that indeed. Venice is a different uh, realm, and and uh, one needs to consider that uh, as well as Milan, because we, uh, of course, uh, Bruni is uh, more uh, uh, afraid of of Milan than than uh, the than Venice as a competition. Milan uh, was uh, uh, in a, an aggressive uh, position against both uh, Florence and and Venice in in his days, so they were uh, uh, in that. Uh, uh, alliance against uh, against Milanese uh, aggression. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very detailed answer. I can see that Isidore has uh, raised his hand. So please. Yes, uh, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, Ferenc. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'll be brief. My question is basically uh, because you mentioned the civic liberties and that uh, Bruni was trying to expose them uh, as much as possible. Uh, I was actually thinking of his uh, contemporary, Poggio Bracciolini, and he has this uh, specific paragraph when he talks that like when he basically defends the Florentine uh, expansion and he says that this was done to defend the home republic, the home city. He says, at defendam urbem patriam. Um, uh, and I was thinking how much of that do you see in Bruni? because he is, uh, expounds that it's about like uh, conquering other cities to defend their liberties uh, at home. Uh, so I was just thinking if you've seen any of that in, uh, in Bruni as well. Thank you. 
Yes, that's that's a very good question. I did not talk about um, so-called foreign relations in in in, the, in, in Brunei, but uh, that's important. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the, the the war over Luca and the interpretation of that uh, relationship is is crucial for 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 him. And well, the ideology is the same. I would say, i.e., that uh, that well, first of all, Florence is for liberty. So even if it conquers, it is for liberty. So that's 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 the basic assumption. And uh, and if you are for liberty, you are allowed to conquer because uh, you will bring uh, liberty wherever you, you conquer. So that's 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 uh, that's the, the the ideological part of it. But uh, but uh, of course, uh, one should uh, keep in mind that uh, that Florence, as opposed to Venice, did not have sea. So uh, uh, empire building is not uh, so easy. Uh, for for them as 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 for Venice, on the other hand, Venice was uh, at least that's the, the general assumption of of the scholarship. Venice was uh, much less uh, aggressive in in his uh, dealings uh, whenever uh, a territory is con uh, conquered. They they would keep things uh, uh, as as. Uh, um, uh, uh, unchanged as possible. So in that sense, uh, they were aware of the fact that that, that uh, in fact uh, it's uh, it's always risky to to conquer and 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 change uh, the political system of a territory because it it can easily uh, uh, you know uh, fight back. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, that Florence Florentine foreign policy. Is uh, is in a difficult uh, position, and and uh, comparatively speaking, it was still successful. But it's only comparatively speaking, and perhaps an, an important element was this uh, this ideology that 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 uh, you always uh, uh, fight for liberty, even if you don't fight on your own grounds, uh, which is of course a difficult uh, endeavor. Yeah, uh, Bracciolini even calls like uh, Florence as the defender of Tuscany, defensor Tuskie, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting, yeah, as you said. Uh, but thank you, thank you again. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think this uh, also comes very close to what I was wondering about while you were talking, how far these uh, ideals expressed by uh, these political thinkers could be extrapolated or how far they uh, intended to express the uniqueness of the, the cities which they describe. So did they want to export this model or rather just uh, praise their own uh, communities? But uh, I don't want to take too much time. So if there, there are uh, others who would like to ask a question, uh, time is a little bit uh, running out now, but I, if there are any. Uh, until then, perhaps I, I try to answer uh, the, the proposal that you made uh, about about uh, the relationship between cities, because I did not, I, I was only concentrating on a single city and not talking about their uh, interconnections. And I think that's crucial that in the Italian, Italian experience, these are very aggressive cities and, and, and city life was indeed um, poisoned by, 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 by you know, the, these uh, uh, dangers of, of, of war, uh, internal war between cities. And I think in this respect, again, one should consider uh, uh, the other experience, which is uh, a coalition of cities, which is uh, much, uh, uh, well, it happens, of course, in Italy, but that's only, uh, I would say, tactical uh, coalitions. And in the German experience, uh, it, or the Northern experience, one could say, uh, the coalition of, of cities is, uh, is more uh, strategic, uh, strategic. And I would say that that's, that's the interesting part of the story for, for us, uh, I, uh, what can be extrapolated from that I, that, uh, that uh, you, you can find a certain uh, aspects where, where you can work together with, with the other cities. So, uh, what uh, you achieved uh, internally should be achieved externally, uh, and uh, even uh, your ideology should uh, follow up uh, along those lines. But I think that Martin has a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'll also be brief. I just wondered, um, 
how far you thought this was a sort of very European story in a sense. Um, also with these broader reflections you had in, at the start about uh, orbs and civitas and so on. Um, and I just wondered if you could reflect a bit on the sort of, um, if there would be any value in adding a sort of global dimension to this, or if you think these are so different notions perhaps of what constitutes a city or a vanity or something like that, that it would be better to sort of just think about this in a, in a European context, in a sense. Um, now, I know um, this sort of goes beyond what you were talking about, but I just wondered if you had some sort of uh, yeah, brief thoughts on, on, on this question. But thank you very much. It was really fascinating. Yes, indeed, that's that's crucial. Uh, we are living in a global world. So uh, what, what about uh, the global city? The question of the global city. And, and indeed, uh, I think that that would be an important task to, to do, i.e. I, I, to write the, the similar stories for different other regions of the world, like the Asian city and the American city and so on and so on, African city. So I think uh, these are uh, kind of uh, um, um, challenges uh, for, for, for uh, colleagues. And if those stories were written, then it would be interesting to see how they relate to each other. And of course, in that, uh, a part, an important part, and we were talking about it in the series earlier, was the, the, the fact that um, the, the flourishing of the European city depended on, on the longer term uh, uh, trade, uh, uh, commerce, uh, uh, i.e. on imperial experiences. And, uh, and in this sense, uh, the stories uh, surely uh, connect with each other. So in this sense, uh, we are uh, determined to, to, to work with, with, with other colleagues who, who would uh, try to make sense of, uh, of the, the historical um, uh, narrative of, of their own urban uh, experiences. And, 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 and then to, to work together on a, a united story. It's, it's, I think, uh, to be done step by step. You cannot uh, write a global history of, of the city because, uh, because you need to, to try. Well, I'm sure that historians were uh, thought that where I was uh, quite negligent in my use of, of, of certain periods, concepts, uh, or, or historical facts. But I needed to generalize in order to, to make general claims. And, and, uh, you have to be careful with generalizations. That's why I say that that you need to do it on a regional level first, and then you, you can have a comparative uh, uh, discipline, which which might uh, which might work out uh, those uh, those uh, interconnections, interfaces, uh, overlaps, uh, and and then the differences between those experiences. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, broadening of the, the view, both uh, through the question and, and your response. I think together with your proposal in your uh, conclusions that uh, citizenship and uh, civic uh, way of uh, thinking about political uh, constituencies is something which uh, needs to be reconsidered in the, the light of our modern experience. So, uh, I think this is uh, the point which really ties together our uh, whole lecture series. And since uh, time is running and uh, probably the audience also needs to uh, engage with other uh, activities, then I would uh, like to conclude this session with this, um, these statements and with this discussion. And this also concludes the, the entire series. I don't know if um, I would like to ask if Susanna, as the other convener of the, uh, the series present here, Zoe had to uh, leave for some official duties. So if you would like to, to add anything in conclusion to uh, what we have been discussing now. What we have been discussing all the, the last 12 weeks. <laughs> Either today or in a broader sense, I just uh, thought of giving uh, the word to you for any uh, additional uh, 
remarks or yeah no, no no not not this not not special ones and totally unprepared but of course i um i am of course um happy to uh, have heard all these um contributions during the last weeks and uh, which also broadened uh, so to say Catalin, our horizon <laughs> and um um supports in that way also our preparation process for the uh, summer school that we hope to <laughs> um, to be able to realize next uh, next July uh, yeah this yes, is yes exactly uh, this kind of general <laughs> reflections were what I thought uh, at this moment and uh, maybe by uh, way of conclusion I would like to, to share two images with you uh, and uh, that will be um, here. Um, the first of, of these two images uh, is from a very famous uh, painting, Fresco, Ambrogio Lorenzetti in Siena, to quote yet another uh, very important Italian city. And this is just a small detail of it. And the reason why I thought of showing it, it's really wonderfully rich in detail, that in the effects of good governance, as he, uh, as Lorenzetti represents it in the Palazzo Publico, there is also a well-organized education. So we can see our speaker today, we can see uh, the audience and how much it contributes to the thriving of the city. So I think it was really a very, um, enjoyable experience to see how uh, lectures, how education can contribute to our better understanding of uh, city life and uh, generally uh, politics and uh, our existence between uh, the medieval and the modern uh, experiences. And uh, finally, I would like to share this uh, bouquet of flowers, uh, Christmas bouquet, and uh, wish you all very happy holiday season. But first of all, I would like to give this, and if it had been in presence, I would have liked to uh, present it uh, in person to Maria, Maria Kiprovska, who has been hosting most of our sessions and who has been always uh, in the background with help to our speakers and uh, being attentive to all uh, arising needs and so thank you very much Maria for uh, being here with us maybe I stop sharing now and you can reveal yourself uh, behind the Democracy Institute logo so uh, thank you very much Kathy this was uh, uh, absolutely uh, wonderful uh, but I, I, I should like to I would like to share this bouquet wonderful bouquet actually to with all of the speakers because they made the lecture series so uh, so uh, wonderful uh, and so uh, uh, um, uh, enlightening for all of us uh, as audience and for uh, also for for their uh, rich support actually because they were very very prepared to 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 share their own experiences with us and with me who was helping behind the screen. Uh, but also thank you for, uh, for, for all of the students uh, who were uh, part of the lecture series, uh, I should say, uh, and uh, they were so uh, uh, good listeners and good discussions as well. Uh, thank you very much. It was a wonderful experience.